Welcome to the Focus Forward Business Podcast for SturdyMcKee.com. How's your business going? I mean, really going. If your answer is, well, some of it's great, and well, some of it's not so great, the first thing you need to know is you are not alone. And there is a way to get more great and less not so great. So check out the 12 Focus Forward Pillars at SturdyCoaching.com. The 12 Focus Forward Pillars are the structure that you need in your business to give you the time and space to pursue your business passion. That's the 12 Focus Forward Pillars at SturdyCoaching.com. Hey, welcome and thank you for listening or watching the Focus Forward Business Podcast. I am Sturdy McKee, Business Coach and Advisor, and I will be your host for the podcast. Um, today, I'm really pleased to bring you Saji Gunawardhan, founder of U.S. Business Council. Um, Saji has a, a kind of a different business model at U.S. Business Council, where he is, in essence, a fractional general legal counsel, kind of, sort of. He's going to elaborate on that in a minute, but to businesses and startups. So um, thanks very much for being here, Saji. Thank you, Sturdy. So will you please tell the folks a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, first off, kudos because you got the name right. It's, it's, pronounced, <laughs> it's pronounced Gunnar Warden, and that's that's pretty darn close you got. It. So uh, if the name like Sturdy, I try I, yeah. listening. <laughs> I try listening. So yes, um, uh, my name is Saji, and my, uh, my firm is U.S. Business Council. We are uh, uh, business attorneys for small to mid-sized businesses that are growing, meaning, meaning uh, the short end of it is they're, they're all in, they want to do it right. They've had an attorney to start out the gate, but they kind of now need somebody who's more of an advisor, someone who's consultative, someone who's accessible, and and uh, and some to some extent also accessible means reasonable, uh, reasonably priced as well. Um, so what we do is we uh, help guide businesses from wherever stage they're at to the next stage and then beyond too. Cool. So is U.S. Business Council your first business? And how did you get started with it? It's, it's my first business, Sturdy, in the sense of the first business that I own uh, okay. is, my, is my law firm. Um, but before that, I've been in the business world from the beginning, I'd say. I mean, I, my background is organizational behavior. Uh, that was my very Berkeley-ish type of major. Uh, but it, it really made sense because that's my, my calling was the psychology of the business. What's what is it, I mean, not to sound too sort of hokey about it, but what, what is it that really sort of um, motivates and, and engenders support and belief and commitment behind the American dream that I think is uh, to own a business and to build a life for yourself? So when it comes to businesses, I, I mean, the, I started working businesses when I was in college, uh, after college. One of them was a family-owned business we took uh, onto NASDAQ. And that experience... Uh, those experiences just made me feel like I want to be engaged and be a part of the growth and part of the, the solutions when the tensions arose. And, and so law was kind of the sensible way. So it's business first, law degree next, and it kind of came together in a way that now makes a lot of sense to, to my clients because they're business owners and I get their, their speak and their tension points. No, that's cool. Well, and, and you're a business owner as well. Yes, that, that, that's the main things. I have the same footing, the same standing, the same pressures, in the sense that it's a tough uh, world, much less, you know, California alone to, to run a business. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and my businesses, when I say my businesses, I feel like my clients are my businesses. They, they, mm -hmm. they are throughout the United States and they have a footprint here, but they're also abroad too. But the whole point is, yes, I get the experience because I'm a business owner too. This is not a firm of uh, you know 20 partners and it's it's so monolithic or, or or removed from the experience of the business owner that we don't understand what they're going through and that's that is a big difference yeah yeah so give us an example or tell a little bit more exactly what you do for clients at US sure. business council sure so i always say this already you, you and i've talked about this there's plenty of great attorneys maybe too many attorneys, I'd say arguably, in, in, in California and in the United States alone. Uh, the differentiating factor of what we do is we're business attorneys. We do contracts, employment law, strategic planning, but we do it in a way that's, like I said, accessible. And, and the root of that is having a business background and business experience, actual business experience is rare for business attorneys. You can have great schooling behind you and, and great... Um, law firm uh, sort of pedigree, if you will. Mm -hmm. 
But the difference really is where does the tire meet the road? And so when I come in on contracts, what we do differently and somewhat innovatively, I think, as a law firm is I ask questions about how we got here and where you're going with it. Because it's got to apply to the business owner and their ambitions and what they're really trying to achieve when I'm gone, when I'm not, not there. Uh, and a lot of us as attorneys only sort of see it as the four corners. We do this, and here it is, and we leave. And so I don't even call myself transactional. I'm more relational in that sense. So that's what we do. Um, that's an example of what we do is uh, on the day to day. I have tech companies that are clients. I have manufacturing companies that are clients. So that can be service agreements, uh, you know, um, MSAs, SOWs. Those, those are uh, statements of work. Um, NDAs because it falls under the purview when the contracts and people come together. There's intellectual property to protect and make sure the business owners uh, share what they need to share with employees, but that stays within uh, the innovation and, and, and ownership of the business. Um, so a lot of protective measures, but also sort of working with the business to, to promote the culture that they're trying to, the cultural values that they're trying to do in a way that's still legal. You know, so it, there's some subjective aspects to this, but there's some concrete things that are tangible, like contracts, employment law, strategic plan. Right. But it sounds like a little bit more advising than maybe a traditional transactional attorney. Yes, it is. And that's why, so the name of the firm is U.S. Business Council and council being C-O-U-N-S-E-O being counseling. Right. And that's, that's uh, inherently, that, that's why I became a lawyer is because I, I do enjoy that aspect of really, uh, I mean, we don't have all the answers as lawyers, right? That, but I think the best we can do is provide assurances uh, to the business owners that, that they're on the right path, that there may be another way of doing things too to consider, that there may be some risk here, but for them to make the business decision to know what those risks are. So that's, that's the counsel aspect of it. So yeah, that's, that is what I do. And I, that's what I, I enjoy the most. It's getting that sort of intrinsic, uh, making them feel like they can sleep better at night, um, not just getting the contract along. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, time and getting things done is always a challenge. There's only so much time. We've got so many competing priorities. Any advice or tips that you have learned along the way that you would want to share with other business owners? Sure. Yeah. I, I would say that, and you don't really learn this, you certainly don't learn this in law school, and you don't learn it uh, until as we've talked about, it, you've run a few laps and, and you've maybe overshot. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, one of the things is sort of the power of no. I mean, you're probably hearing a lot of optimism on my, on my voice and I, I really am a very glass half full person, but I do believe it, when you're mitigating risk, which is a very important part of growing a business, it's still looking at the tail, making sure your, your periphery is clear. A lot of that also means establishing the right goals Sticking with the plan, you and I've talked about this. We're developing some, some work in that regard, you and I. That that is so important. And having your designees, your your peers, your, your colleagues, the people you hire as your, your your lieutenants, if you will, on the same page in that, uh, I think is, is so important because what I've learned is the power of no. When I say that is is also making sure that you're clear in your objectives and you're staying on that path. So opportunities under the shining objects, like you call it in, in your work. Um, those have to be batted out and, and avoided at all costs. We have a lot of businesses that have like a visionary person, sometimes a very objective person as partners, and there's a nuance in between that where you want to encourage innovation and you want to encourage that forward thinking, but you also have to have a very stable um, sort of even keel. And that can, can't be done by one partner alone. That's where a team of, like myself, a competent CPA, um, and a common other advisors on, on, on the team, HR people can, can help. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you and I've talked about this before too, there, that there's a sense of isolation very often, or sometimes we feel like we're going it alone as business owners. Um, one thing that we don't tend to share, um, partly out of courtesy, you know, politeness or, or, or whatever, is the challenges and, and, you know, obstacles that we're currently running into or facing. Um, but I think that's an important part of not feeling like you're completely alone. So what would you share any challenges or things that you're currently coming up against that um, might be a benefit to the folks listening? Well, I think you alluded to something earlier on about the experience of a business, running a business. And I think that that a lot of us, I'll say again, my, my brethren, uh, as, as lawyers, we there's a part to play almost in society and you play the part, you play it well, you wear your suit and, and, and you sort of have to have this, this uh, veneer uh, of almost 
infallibility and 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 you know um, sort of invincibleness. But the truth the truth of the matter is we're just as vulnerable as the, as the next business. Mm -hmm. uh, this pandemic was a great example of that. When that came uh, into play and surprised all of us as it did um, in 2020, in the early part of 2020, it. I remember some of my my colleagues in, in bigger firms were just as concerned as other uh, attorneys as well because the entire system was sort of called into question. You know how how the billing practices are, how the client relationships are. Um, so you know, for me, I think one of the things that that I learned is that uh, the challenges are it goes back to keeping on on task. I have a very straightforward mission at U.S. Business Council. That is to be advisory, to be giving the assurances, like I said, and I don't overshoot and think that I'm, I can do, I can pro provide all the solutions to the business owner's needs. But what I'm effective at is bringing in the key uh, advisors that we need to help the business. So I can help see some of the things ahead of time that the business owners may not be able to see because they're doing so well at what they're doing. But by doing that uh, ahead of time, I can see some of the, the things that we need to navigate and bring in. Uh, you know, uh, leadership coaches, um, competent finance folks, uh, just benefits people, people who can help th help us get to the next stage and through the challenges that, that we're facing now. So I think a challenge that I've faced before has been, and, and the ver versus now, is that some business owners don't really appreciate risk like the way, the way that they do now. In the post-pandemic world, they are now listening. And so it has been a challenge. It yeah. has been a challenge before where they'll bring me in and they'll listen, but they'll have to prioritize based on you know understandable needs. Right. But right. now I think there's an appreciation for risk where you and I have talked about this. I actually lean in and say there's certain risk you have to kind of embrace. And, mm -hmm. and and I think that not to go too off your question here, but I think that has been a challenge in the past, but I see it as an opportunity now more than before. Well, in so many challenges there are opportunities in a little bit different context. I agree. Right. So very much so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, what's your proudest moment in business so far? I like these questions. They, they, they make you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, proudest moments, gosh. You know, uh, I think that, I'll tell you what's not my proudest moment. I, I'll tell you that I'm not the attorney you're going to find um, gloating about uh, a particular shiny award I got. Or, uh, or or a title for such and such fill in the blank of the year, um, because I, I I just learned that, and this kind of came from my corporate experience too, uh, not to be swayed by the corner office, um, and that mentality, and also to be frank, as a business owner, it's a hard haul, and when you're doing your own business, it's a hard haul too. So, what is it that keeps people happy, keeps you fulfilled at the at the, the the zenith and perhaps at the end of your your practice your your as an attorney it's really hard we have a very um, a lot of us are very unhappy it's very unfulfilling sometimes and maybe materially successful but empty in other ways so my proudest moment honestly is keeping an even keel and and keeping myself in check in the sense that my my business owners are my check if they're doing well I'm doing well we I grow with them I'm not trying to exceed my growth by any means. If that if that balance changes, then something's actually wrong. If I'm doing better than my businesses, then there's something not quite right. That's actually the traditional law firm model, I think. And I can. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah, it's it's that billable hour where we can make a lot of money off of off of the struggles of of our clients. And I think for me, my proudest moment is not having to do it that way, but still mm -hmm. feeling like I'm accomplishing something, which is the good of the business. When the uh, waters are calm, that means we're doing something right. And I say not just me, we are collectively, myself, the business owners and the advisors. And for me, uh, having a balanced life so that I can have a personal life that's also fulfilling too. No, that's great. And I think one of the one of the insights here and one of the challenges for a lot of the folks who are listening is that you took something that's a very traditional, old, conservative profession and put a completely different business model spin on it. You know, it's not how many billable hours and what I can charge for it or whatever. It's in essence, a subscription model, right? Where you support and are there for your clients on a regular basis and follow that journey with them. And that's, you know, I think we, 
I've seen that in other models, certainly with business coaching and all right, but you don't see that very much in the legal world. Yeah, you're right. And, and you're pointing out something which I don't lean in much and say, hey, we, we offer this this way, but you're right. That, 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 that is a differentiating factor. The second of the two factors that maybe differentiates my practice from others is, um, one, I, I like to think it's that philosophical approach I've been talking about of, mm -hmm. of good intent and, and, and sort of willful intent and uh, seeing it through, which is, comes from real business experience. And the second you've is- you've operationalized that. And I've operationalized that. The second way is this, is this flat fee model. Our corporate counsel program is, is what you're referring to as a subscription, is a flat fee model. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that, it was, was uh, you know, I started my practice in 2008, my, this, this firm. And that was right on the, the, the cusp of the financial crisis, as you remember. Right. And, and so it was intuitive to me because at that time I was doing litigation. I had a lot of uh, uh, litigation experience before I went back into the business uh, realm, but I just realized that, again, clients and their affordability and what, what would really work for them. Then I realized as I'm in the business setting, remembering how you know my senior people uh, who are business owners when I was working at businesses before, and as I got into middle management and, and executive management, the tension was always the cost of the lawyer. Uh, and because and sure. you have great great lawyers, but gosh, picking up the phone and calling us was was it the was last not resort. A, last resort. But the secret, the dirty secret for my profession on that is we don't mind because if we're having a billable hour model, then you're going to call us more uh, when you need us. And at that time, it's going to take more work for us to get you out of the mess you're in. And that that just kind of, sort of uh, is a self fulfilling prophecy for law firms. I just decided to do this flat fee model. It's not entirely altruistic. What it is, is it's just fair because now it's predictive. The business owners will know what they're paying for for the year that they, they sign up with me. And we build a relationship over the course of that year. Invariably, they always renew each time because it's predictive. They build it into the budget and that's it. Now, there will be unpredictable things that happen along the way, but there's never any sort of know shell game happening or or uh, smoke and mirrors because they know what they've built into and if unpredictable things like a dispute arises or we got to go to trial and litigation things or specialized needs come up then of course i bring in the advisors but even then i can manage that because i've done litigation before in a way that the business owners don't need to panic about it and, and it's still affordable so yeah that that's it is subscription in that sense but it's relational and it's predictive uh oh, it's, yeah uh, yeah yeah I, I didn't mean to minimize it in any way that way i, no, I think I you know you're that model though, I mean, you, you think about big businesses, right? And, and everybody thinks the big businesses have all these advantages. There are a lot of advantages small businesses have, but um, we won't go down that rabbit hole right this minute. But one of the advantages a big business has is if they have attorneys on staff, that is a, pre, you know, it's a predictable expense. It's already yes. budgeted for, it's already there. And then of course, like you said, if something untoward or unforeseen happens, then maybe they have, need for additional expertise or whatever. But, you know, for so many smaller businesses, we go along trying to avoid that cost until it, like you said, maybe it's not too late, but it's a bigger mess to resolve and un unwind and, and all that versus expecting and budgeting and having a, a predictable cost and an yeah. advocate. And, and it's, it also relates what you're saying right now, certainly relates to what you said before, which is that, that you know, what I mentioned about the risk mitigation, people mm -hmm. appreciating risk now in this in this post-pandemic or mid-pandemic, right. midst, midst pandemic uh, uh, time period. And hopefully I think this continues on, just that appreciation for risk because now business owners are listening because they can understand that that they want to get ahead of, of the, the next unpredictable thing, right? As much as possible. I always I don't overpromise. I said that before too. I don't try to overpromise because I think that's there's just bad business and bad form. Uh, overall, but I always tell my business owners it's a matter of not a matter of if, but when. So let's get ready for it. Now, getting ready for it is a very real thing <laughs> because people understand <laughs> that they understand um, you know, what what a um, what a pandemic can be like, what a unpredictable uh, government regulatory uh, scheme can be like, uh, what a, what unpredictably comes from what you thought was a stable and predictive and reliable workforce. Um, right. So right. all these factors kind of come into play. And, and so I think this is a great time for innovators, for entrepreneurs, for business owners. It's almost like a reset. And for us as advisors, as key advisors in law, in finance, uh, in, in 
all the areas that that essentially help with leadership development and 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 cultivating essentially and, and curating the right people the right the right um, focus points sort of re resetting it again this is I don't I don't think we get a time like this again in sort of modern business history to do this full reset um, I can go on about that but I think that that one of the key roles I can play is in that in that aspect oh, that's cool thank you um, so what's one of the biggest lessons you learned recently that you wish maybe you had known 10 years ago or maybe before 2008 when you started? Ah, what, what, like a recent lesson I learned yeah. that I didn't know before, gosh. Um, uh, well, I, I think it, it kind of comes back down to the, what you, you, really, you really knew it, but you didn't, <laughs> didn't really uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm talking a lot about how business owners didn't appreciate. They always appreciate risk, but now they have a, a newfound appreciation for it. It's the same for us as advisors too. Mm -hmm. I think that, that what I maybe didn't realize as much, well, I can tell specifically. As a lawyer, a lot of us don't know why we're going to law school. A lot of us don't, which, which manifests, I think, in time. When you have a great lawyer, lawyer from a law firm and you see that they're taking the time to really care about your business, it's because they want to be that lawyer. They want to be with you. Right. Um, like in any profession, sorry, for what you do, you can't do what you do if you don't really have the intrinsic, authentic passion to really help transform right, the business leader from where they are to where they want to go. It, it's, it's the same for me too. And I think that what I've learned is that aspect of staying true to who you are, uh, no matter what the profession is. And, and for me, that's the case. I always say for new attorneys who are coming in or pre-law people, sometimes people have their, their kids talk to me and I say, first thing I ask is always like, why? You know, why do you have to? <laughs> And I don't say that in a way like, why, you know, uh, turn around so you don't want to do this. <laughs> because you don't want to, I, I never believe in, in quashing anyone's ambition or dream, whatever it be. Um, I think we do that far too much from the age of five onward, right? I mean, that's right. You know, layers of expectations on people. But then if they're at that cusp of wanting to make a commitment to a career like law, what I've learned along the way is, is check and balance. I ask myself the same question I asked them, is the why. Am I still doing this because of the same reason that I, I started before? And the answer invariably and thankfully, and I'm grateful to say is, is yes. Uh, I'm probably more inspired because I meet people like you who are outside of my profession, who are doing the same thing in a different, different realm, but we can come together and really make a, a difference for businesses that I couldn't do alone either. So uh, that's kind of what I've learned. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, any favorite business books or articles or anything you're reading right now that, um, or have, in the past that you think would be of benefit? So you know, I'll, I'll say one book that's, it's because there's so many great business books and sometimes, there are. you know, good to great uh, people. And, and we, we circle around them as a business community, sometimes a society before you know it, Oprah's recommending it and, and it becomes this thing that's larger than uh, the nuts and bolts and the essence of what you may be looking for as a business leader. So I actually read more things that are, honestly, writings from colleagues, those kinds of things too, mm -hmm. um, seminars, and, and, and listen to my business owners. But one of the books that I'd recommend that is not a business per se book is The Power of Now um, by, um, by um, Toll. I his name for some reason. Um, in fact, I have a copy of it somewhere here. Um, Eckhart Toll. Eckhart Toll. Uh, psychology book, but it is about being present. It's about being aware and staying cognizant of the now. It's, it's, it's your voice, um, and that reflects its business owners too. You have to be aware of the why, um, stay in check with the why, some things we talked about today too, and also not lose sight of the now. We do so much on the planning for the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. All we can do is look back one year and see that that plan is no longer an effective plan. Neither of those plans. But by appreciating that, it's because we are aware of the now. We're aware of where we're at and what we take stock and what, what we have as strengths now that we may not have seen before because we're so busy planning on the future, right? So, so the now is so much about that singular voice, being aware and in touch with the singular voice, not being afraid or swayed by the collective voice, which oftentimes wants to move you in one direction you know, whether you're, you're being mobilized in the education system that way, whatever it is, it's a collective way of moving you forward without necessarily being present. But so I think, again, again, I think that when world dynamics change and economics call for you to stop, 
to freeze and pause. This is at no time like any other in, in modern business history, maybe in, in, our, in our lives, to actually pause and take stock in the now. And that's what the philosophy of that, that book and his, his teachings are. Well, and that's the why and those things are what I thought of immediately when you were asking like the, you know, aspiring law student, why are you doing it? You know, mm -hmm. that being pushed, the, the collective voice or other people outside of you, um, kind of basically setting your goals to meet other people's expectations, right? Versus yeah. being present and thoughtful and true to yourself and what you really want to do. And it's easier said than done. I think that one of the For blessings, sure. one of the blessings yeah. in life is obviously your health and your and your family and your loved ones. But having that that tribe, it doesn't have to be a, a large set. But having the people, I, I have a business owner. Um, he's not he's not even a client, but he's a close friend of mine, and he's a husband of a of a dear friend. And we're talking business talk, and and he opens up to me about his leadership and his growth, and and it's that that aspect of realizing there are people in your now. There are people in your circle that you didn't realize are so helpful for your state of mind and for the, the success of the business and the, given where we're at, that we can we can grow fivefold, tenfold, more than we, we did even before. And I can solve that problem that was lingering before that I didn't know I could because I'm so present, number one, in the now. Number two, I have those people, another set of blessings, those people around me already. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think what I'd say to business owners or to new business owners and innovators um, is stay with your passion, remember your why, and, and always, always be very present in the now as much as possible and keep yourself uh, surrounded by people who are, who are also equally rooted that way too. You're always aiming high, but you're rooted with a strong foundation of what that now and what that why is. Because it's gonna be tense and you're gonna get lured by shiny objects, by infiltrators that comes from the outside and from the in, uh, regulatory matters, and legal matters too. But if you are steady in that, that, that's the most successful businesses and business owners uh, around the world, people that we look up to and, and thought leaders, they've never strayed from what they believe that the essence of the business should be and the mission and the now. And they didn't do it alone. It's because they had good advisors and good, good uh, trusted folks. Right. No, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, any other thoughts you want to leave us with before we wind down? Gosh, I, I'm hoping I answer your question. So I, I don't know what else to leave you with, except that I, I don't think any of us really have the answers, right? I mean, a lot of us are, are good speakers uh, to some degree. We we uh, want to share our learnings. I think one thing is maybe what I'm learning also is is uh, to pause and to listen. Um, I think that's something that I probably inherently do pretty well. Um, I'm now sort of leaning more in, and into who I am, I think, and, and it's nice to arrive at that. But I'm also still constantly, because I'm wired this way, listening. And I think a lot of people who I see also as, as people I look up to, um, we're talking together about this and the power of listening. And actually, not only to yourself and your voice and the things we talked about, but also to critique and to to uh, competitors and, and realizing there, there's a communal aspect to growth. It doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, a mentality of scarcity. Uh, and I think that that is something I'd leave you with is that thought that competition doesn't mean you need to crush the other person in order to survive. In fact, it's not about surviving. It's about succeeding and how you define the success, right? I would define success in a way that's not just monetary, but a fulfilling life and the life I want to build, family and, 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 and a, a true community. And so I'd say, just remember that that through challenge and everything to listen, to not lose track of what you you, you believe, accept criticism, um, and try to be empathetic, and then use those as as, as tools. So you can really power yourself to get to the next level in life. I would just say accept well-intentioned so, criticism and filter it because sometimes we get kind of back to the your earlier comments. You know, we get told no, you can't do that or whatever, and it's not necessarily coming from a a place of support. <laughs> Right. So I, I think that's a really good qualification. I, I think that keeping the abundance mindset that got you here, that's going to get you forward, will help you to see when those criticisms that you're talking about come in from a scarcity mindset. Right. That's not that's not the, the one that's going to affect you, and you know where they're coming from, and maybe you can impart with them something that'll help them, but let, let that not stray you from your mission. 
No, but no, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Saji. This has been a, a, an insightful, very thoughtful discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you, Sturdy, and thank you for doing this. I think it's really great what you're doing for innovators, for new business owners, for current leadership. Just this is this is how you do it. I think this, we have to have these conversations and learn from each other. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.